Hey folks, in this episode, it's all about artificial intelligence. This is Twitter. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today on the hot seat, I have my good buddy, Mr. Richard Harrington in place. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and everything in between to get a better understanding of what these terms mean as applied to photography. We've heard different we've heard these terms used in different ways, you know, some incorrectly, some correctly. I brought Richard on to to get to the bottom of this. Richard Harrington, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Good. Good to be here. It's good to have you. All right. So um machine learning. Yep. Artificial intelligence. All right, let me let, let me start here. So I've heard, you know, so you you you're you're you know in the whole field of like listening to what Elon Musk and all those guys are doing <laughs> in terms of the, you know, trying to teach cars how to see on the road, and they're using right. what artificial intelligence or machine learning, basically a bunch of situations you throw at a computer yeah. so that it knows how to handle them in the future. Same thing applies to photography. Right. Right. So, hey, here's an image and there's a lot of blue at the top and a lot of brown at the bottom. It's probably a beach scene. So do this. Right. right? So what's the difference? Let's start with that. What's the difference between. Well, let's even start with this. What is artificial intelligence? And then we'll move to machine learning. Well, artificial intelligence is this idea that the computer can help you. And the thing is, is that we've been using artificial intelligence for a very long time. Right. Like, how long has there been an auto button inside of Photoshop? Mm -hmm. You know, do you click the auto button in Lightroom? Well, that's kind of like early generation artificial intelligence. It's the computer trying to make a decision based upon what some engineer trained it to do and think is right. And we've seen those auto buttons get better. You know, I know that if I option click on the auto button in Photoshop, there's four secret recipes and a color cast recipe and it unlocks some pretty cool tech and I can go in and tweak it and reset the auto to my own recipe. But that's sort of buried in the hood. And so we've always had automatic, right? We Mm -hmm. have automatic cars. We've got all sorts of things, right? You've got speed dial on your phone. So, you know. It's like when I talk to people who get all snooty about HDR. Oh, HDR is garbage and da 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 And I'm like, do you use the shadow highlight slider? You ever touch the clarity slider? Shut the hell up. <laughs> <laughs> you use HDR, okay? And you're using like version one of it and it's not even that good. So do people use bad HDR? Absolutely, you know, but tools like Aurora and Photomatics and Lightroom all do HDR and when used correctly, it's amazing. And now Aurora HDR does something totally different using AI. So it uses artificial intelligence to find all the edges in the photo and then detect the best parts that you shot that were properly exposed and then recombine those. So I talk to a lot of folks who are doing this complex manual layer masking of different images together for things like architecture or real estate and they paint these masks painstakingly. And the truth of the matter is, is Artificial intelligence can do that. Like it's pretty easy to detect edges. And so it comes down to what do you want the computer to help you with? And what do you want to do completely by hand? And I'm of the belief that it's okay to take assistance as long as you don't give up control. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's okay to know how to drive in an automatic car or a stick yeah. shift as long as you, or an automatic as long as you know how to drive a stick shift and you know what's yeah. what's what's happening when the car is shifting gears right yeah so, so you, hit, you know what happens when you hit the sand or the snow and how to drive you know, exactly you gun it right but how do you so is to put a finer point on it is artificial intelligence in my head when i think artificial intelligence as applied to photography i think okay i'm going to feed my computer, whatever app it may be, I'm going to feed it this particular image and there's a robot in there, there's a a Jarvis in there that (laughs) knows what's in the photo. It's going to say, hey, this is a tree, that's sand, this is a person, this person is closer to the camera in focus, those are further away, so I'm going to pay more attention to the one that's closer and then I'm going to do these things to it because I see two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, I'm going to do all this stuff. You know, that's what I think of artificial intelligence and And even then, I don't assume that it's going to be smarter than I am. I think it's going to remove uh, a lot of the effort that I would have to get to to get to a good starting point where I can then tweak. 
Is that is that fair? What's going on, or is that is that yeah. science fiction? No, no. I mean, that's that's the gist. And think of it this way, right? So let's step back to cameras for a moment before we get to software. So your camera takes in data, right? It reads the exposure. And if you're using a mode like aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode, you've dialed in some controls. And then based on your input, the camera calculates everything else. But you still have the exposure compensation dial if you you want to override that, right? So that camera has been programmed to make decisions on its own based on recipes or criteria that you've picked. If I'm flying a drone now, you know, my new drone from DJI has, you know, collision detection. So if I'm not paying enough attention and I get too close to an object, I was flying in the desert and I was, you know, I was doing a backwards tracking shot and it got really close to a cactus and it just stopped. It detected that it was getting close to something and it knew to stop. Yeah. Well, I'm not upset that I didn't crash my drone, yeah. you know, but it was, you know, it stopped within six inches. So, you know, if I was really pushing it and you could turn that stuff off, you know, if you don't want that collision detection on, it's an option. So you're right when it comes to photography, right? So if I fire open uh, perfectly clear or I fire open uh, Luminar, both of them have some built in artificial intelligence. You know, perfectly clear is able to recognize key details about the face and recognize that there are faces and use that to help calculate exposure. And over on the Luminar side, they just updated their Accent AI 2.0. It's able to identify that there's people in there and favor that so that when it starts calculating colors and suggestions on how to fix contrast and saturation and depth and tone, that it doesn't overdo the skin tones. Mm -hmm. But you still have a slider. And that slider goes from zero to 100. And you know the recommended value is around 60. But if you want more, turn it up. If you want less, turn it down. If you don't want it at all, turn it off. Mm -hmm. But what I'm finding is the old days of, oh, I'm gonna develop this picture. You know, what would most people do in Lightroom? They'd click the auto button and then they'd look at it and then they go, well, the shadows aren't quite right. And okay, I lift the shadows. Now, if I lifted the shadows, I have to pull the blacks down. Otherwise it looks washed out. And then I recovered the highlights, but oh, the whites are dingy. Let's pop those. And oh, let's put some clarity in and let's do a curve. Well, you're doing the same sorts of things to every picture. And so what happens here is there's really two ways that AI can go about. One is eventually we'll get to the point where AI starts to learn what you want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it starts thinking and anticipating what you want. And your phone already does this, right? Like if you told your phone, hey, call my wife, the first time you say that, it's going to say, who's your wife? Once you told it, it's going to assume that that's still your wife until you tell them, oh, hey, Siri, I got divorced. Yeah. My new wife's name is this. <laughs> exactly. You know, you trained your device. It learned and you just don't think about it again, you know, because it's conversational. Say, hey, call my wife as opposed to, oh, call Megan Ryan Harrington cell phone. So it gets this and I can figure it out. And that's but training though, right? That, that's, that's, that is. that's training the software or the robot, let's call it, or mm -hmm. the Jarvis to, yeah. to, so that you train it once and then from that point forward, presumably your life is easier. Right. But right. what do you what do you say? Like, you know, I know you get this questions at trade shows, et cetera, from mm -hmm. the purists like you brought yeah. the, the purists that will say, you know, that's horse pucky. Right. Why, why, why? You know, letting I, I'm a photographer and mm -hmm. only real photographers, you know, yeah. will, will handle the whole development process. I was resistant to using these computers in Lightroom, et cetera. And, right. you know, in the beginning. And now you're telling me to hand over control of my image. Only I know what I want on the image. And anything beyond that is lazy. Mm -hmm. What do you say to those folks? Well, it's really simple. So if you are a purist and you only shoot JPEG and you do no post-processing, fantastic. You know, I, I've had the benefit of going out in the field and, you know, producing some training titles and watching people like Joe McNally work. And I cannot believe how amazing his images are right in camera. But I also see how much skill and talent and hard work and, you know, sometimes a team and support and equipment go into that. Yeah. And and then, you know, there's times that I'm a travel photographer and I got a, you know, a camera on my hip and I'm a tourist and I'm in, you know, Shanghai or I'm in Shenzhen and I'm traveling through China. I'm about to hop on a plane next week to Brussels. And, you know, I've got a micro four thirds camera and two lenses in a bag and I'm going to get some great images 
but I'm not going to be traveling with all this gear and all this stuff. And why do we shoot raw? Well, we shoot raw so that we can make decisions later. Yeah. You know, we say, you know what? I'm going to play this one safe. Every single thing the camera sees, put that on the memory card and I'll decide what to do with it later. Yeah. Well, if you're using raw, then just admit that you like to edit or you want to make changes. And, you know, last time I checked, a camera was a lot cheaper than the human eye. So right. what we want to have accomplished is usually impossible in a camera. Might be possible with HDR, might be possible with, you know, expanded dynamic range techniques, greater bit depth, but it requires some post-processing. You know, even this web signal here, you know, we tweaked our cameras, we adjusted them beyond the settings, but, you know, these are the things that, you know, you can still be in control. So people who freak out about AI typically don't understand where it comes from. So you mentioned machine learning before. Yeah. Machine learning is not a bad word. So what happens here, like I can tell you having worked with training software, where it comes from. So like Skylum has a whole AI lab and you know, I've been working with them off and on as a consultant, helping with some products. And you know, what they'll do is, oh, hey, we're coming out with some new stuff for people who do architecture photography. Well, they'll go out and get thousands of before and after images from top photographers and pay them to use their work. And they run that through the computer and they say, this is how the image came out of the camera. And this is what the person decided was good. And so when you train your machine learning by feeding in professional examples from the types of people that a lot of these folks pay to watch tutorials from or mm -hmm. pay to take workshops from, well, these people are simply saying, all right, let's make the photo industry better and make it easier. And so there's lots of things I can do by hand, right? So for example, I do color grading all the time. And I am an expert when it comes to working with curves and doing per channel color correction. And I can make selections in Photoshop all day long and get exactly what I want. And if I don't have to teach it, like I'm doing a tutorial, I can get it done in about five or six minutes. Now, I've been using Photoshop for more than 20 years, since version 1.2, when it was not even Adobe's. And I know the thing inside and out. But people will come to a class and want to learn Photoshop from me, and I could teach them. And if they practice and work super hard, they might be able to do that same technique in 20 or 30 minutes per image. Well, the reality is, is very rarely are people paying for that. Yeah. So if you use AI to speed things up, so be it. I would tell folks all the time that a tool like Perfectly Clear is great if people want to do all their client first passes. Hey, don't care if you want to do everything by hand, but before you show the client the untouched photos, let them see the photos that have been optimized and say, hey, these have not been hand processed, but here's some for you to look at. And you can still tweak those recipes. I wrote about three fourths of the presets that ship with Perfectly Clear. Yeah. So, you know, I've learned that software can be fine tuned and I get people's, oh, this is great. This saves me so much time. Well, yeah. What it really comes down to is, is all the time people will say to me, I really wish I could develop photos like you could. And I say, great, let's spend 120 hours learning these techniques. No, I'd rather spend one hundred twenty dollars. Okay, <laughs> there you go, there you go. I mean, you see that, and that's the bottom line. I mean, you hit you yeah. hit a couple of things there. You hit the the whole idea of the raw versus JPEG argument, right? Which yeah. is like like I say on the show a lot. People, photographers especially, love to argue with each other, right? Yeah. They love to have the <laughs> my 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 marbles are better than your marbles. Yes. You know, my, this what raw versus JPEG, Nikon, Canon, mirrorless right. versus DS, it goes on and on and on. Um, but in the end, I think you, you, you surmised it nicely. It boils down to when you're shooting raw, you're making the assumption. It's not lazy. I, don't, I think it's technology. It's you're, you're asking the camera to record the best that, that that hardware sees of that scene, and then you'll make decisions on the edit later because yeah. you know it can't see the blown out sky or whatever, and you could bring that back, et cetera. If, yeah. you, if you are a, quote, purist, and you want to simulate let's say E6 slide film, then yeah. shoot raw or shoot JPEG, right? Yeah. And and don't touch the images. And it's as simple as that, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I look at some of the photos that I shot black and white in film and camera and I love them. And they've got a great feel. 
But if I look at them with the standards that people apply today, boy, those shadows are a little muddy. Boy, I really wish the there was better contrast here on the sky. Oh, if I only had that glass filter that I could have screwed on. And then if I just had the variable ND that I had also attached so that the horizon was perfect. Or, oh, gee, it's so easy with the raw data to create a ramp here. And, oh, yeah, Lightroom has great tools for auto masking based on color or threshold or luminance. You know, so it's interesting what people freak out about. Somehow people think uh, AI means they're not in control, yet they use automation all the time. Mm -hmm. We've had automation all the time. People made Photoshop actions to save time. All that's happened is it's getting scary because AI has gotten better. And this may sound unpopular, but here's my analysis on it. Um, the video industry already went through this, right? Like, you know, I used to get paid more to be a video editor than video editors make 20 years now later. You know, they get paid about half as much as I used to get paid because the equipment used to be incredibly expensive and the skill used to be incredibly scarce. And now my daughter in fifth grade works on a weekly show and gets to edit video in her grade school using equipment that would have cost a house when I started in my career. So photography is so interested in holding on to the mystique. And instead of focusing on, oh, I'm an expert communicator and I can help my clients with their marketing and I create images that families love and I'm full service and I'll help them get great prints and make the right decisions and help them with the whole messaging, we latch on to, oh, it's a black art and it's mystery. And, you know, we argue about stuff that the clients don't care about. Yeah. So all the clients care is that you have a good looking image. And I've never been asked by a client, how'd you make that image? They just want to see the results. Yeah. Some of them are interested in the back end. So the only people that ask those questions are other photographers, right? Right. And it's and gear is not the secret to work. So I look at it this way. I could do just about anything in a post-production tool. I can manually mask together 20 layers. I can go through and draw selection and adjustment layer and paint things in and dodge and burn all day long. Or I can run AI, get it to be 90% where I want it to be, and then use my skill to take it from a 85 or a 90 to a 99 or a 100. But I only had to do a third to maybe 10% of the work to get it there as opposed to doing all that other work. So AI doesn't put you out of a job. Yeah. AI takes all the boring, mundane stuff that you were going to have to do anyways and lets you do the final artistry that much quicker. All right. Well, well, here, here's a, here's another question. Yeah. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, I interviewed one of the one of the imaging scientists at Skyloom, yeah. and and you know it was sort of a blue sky, no pun intended, sure. conversation. Yeah. Right? Where's it going to go? Right? Yeah. Where's it going to go? So where is all this stuff going? And at the end of the interview, he was. It was a great interview, and I would encourage people to watch it. I'll link to it uh, in yeah. the in the description for this one. Um, but he was saying that in the future, you should be able to speak to your computer, you know, completely taking the camera out of the mix, and you should be able to say, "Hey, I want a beach." And on this beach, there are two people. One of them has a red bikini. Uh, one of them <laughs> has some short, uh, is a male yeah. with boxer shorts with palm trees on it. Yeah. There's a blue sky. There's a sailboat on the horizon. Yeah. There's some puffy white clouds with some seagulls flying over on in the distance. Yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. And boom, the computer will hear that and generate that image. Uh, well, where is that the future? Today, I mean, is it. Is the future of AI that where we're just going to be able to speak what's in our mind's eye and have the have a computer generate it and not have to worry about photography and lenses and sensors and all that? Well, so that's possible and it's possible today, right? Photo compositors already do that by getting stock images or shooting pieces or people like Burt Monroy paint it, right? Yeah. That sort of stuff already exists. Visual effects industry, you know, people are shocked. Just look at some of the behind the scenes and not just on Marvel superhero movies of how much is shot on green screen, yeah. you know, and there's great folks that are doing, you know, green screen work or simple backdrops and compositing in new backdrops. You're talking about uh, me right now, aren't you? I know. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Great <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this happens all the time already. 
Um, and we get the sources from a variety of places. But what, you know, Adobe's already shown some of this stuff too, where, you know, they can synthesize and fill in new areas based on stock libraries of like, oh, I need a new beach here and I want to remove all this. And it finds a relative photo and patches it in. Um, I think what it comes down to is what type of art do you like? So if you like painting, you create things with your mind all the time. I am, you know, a journalist by trade and a documentary filmmaker by trade. And I like to capture reality. I studied history in school and I like to capture stories and preserve that. So yeah. for me, I'm a purist, but I believe that technology should help me make the images look as best as possible and get them out there in new and more interesting and enjoyable ways. So I want the picture to have as much detail as possible, which is why I make panoramic images and time-lapse images and HDR images, because I don't mind putting in the work to make something that sucks people in so they can see these places that I get to see that they can't. Um, but I'm still creating that reality. It's mm -hmm. just going to get easier to create the reality I want. So if you're a purist and you just believe I take a picture in a JPEG and what I got is what I got, well, that's one end. And at the other end is the person who paints what they want or Bert Monroy who creates realistic photographs out of pure painting and not a single photograph goes into it and it's all in his mind and he can spend a year on a project and it's amazing. Yeah, I love I mean, it. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, I've seen him do that's that. That's a spectrum, right? Yeah. So where do you fall on that spectrum? So a Brooke Shaden does composites all the time and does them well. And that's a type of artistry. Other people do it invisibly, right? Like they shoot in a studio, but then they may comp in some other elements. So I think the reality is, is that we will be able to just tell our computers what we want, but we already do that. We already touch the screens. You know, gone are the days of using a keyboard and a mouse and, a, you know, you probably were around Frederick for the light pen. You remember the light pen? Right? I do. Like I do. Embarrassing. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> input devices change. So all what doesn't change is creativity, right? So there's always somebody out there who will work less for you. Uh, less than you. There's already somebody out there who's always more creative than you. But I always say, when given the choice, people do business with people they like and respect. Yeah. So if your goal is to monetize your photography, be an excellent businesswoman or businessman. If your goal is to just make great images and get them out there, be a passionate artist. That can never be replaced by a computer. But a computer can help you get your job done quicker. So it's so funny that people get on high horses about purist and then you ask them, you know, do you use Photoshop or Lightroom? Well, yeah, but only for this. Okay. Well, what about that generation 20 years ago that were people, Oh, you're such a dinosaur. You won't embrace digital. You know, this is going on away. Well, yeah, you know, film basically died. It's come back a little bit like, just like how vinyl records have come back. But how important are vinyl records versus Spotify and Apple Music? Right. So, you know. Yeah, it's you'll... interesting that that, that it, you know, you, you, I know you've heard this. So you've been around. So you've heard the like, here's an example. Uh, I'm a. I'm an available light photographer. I only oh, I, I love that one. I only shoot with available light because you uh -huh. know that that artificial light that's for lazy people. I only use available yeah. light. And then, as you, I'm sure know, most of those people make that statement because mm -hmm. they don't understand strobe or they don't understand how to control light or exposure and that sort of thing. Um, there's that old you know, there's the old adage of the other side of the spectrum of I only shoot with available light. Uh, any light that's available, right? <laughs> so right. <laughs> that's available to me. How does that apply? Do you think that that thinking applies to this AI world where people that's that are the purists are the ones that just don't understand the tool yet and are resistant to change, and instead they just resort to you know what? I'm just going to go the old the 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 way that I've been doing forever or the right. non tech way because I don't know what all that voodoo is. What what do you think about that? Well, so, you know, I don't usually use strobes uh, personally myself. I see the value of them. I own them. Uh, I occasionally use them. You know, I am more of a WYSIWYG shooter, but I will use all sorts of, you know, um, constant lighting, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll, I'll create what I want. You know, and that comes partially because of a video background. But, you know, I know that you have to control the light. So whether you're using a reflector to bounce the sunlight or you're turning the person so the light hits their face, 
All of this is just nonsense. We, by our very nature, manipulate the images or the scenes. Like if the, if the light was awful on my face, you might turn my body 40 degrees to get a better position or put the light behind me, et cetera, to get the shot, right? Well, that's just common sense. So whether you use a reflector or you use a light or you use the tool, it's a matter of what tool you're comfortable with. So I do available light photography all the time, but I'll open up the single RAW files into Aurora HDR and let it maximize every single detail and merge it back into a new file that's incredibly well exposed with perfect shadows, perfect highlights, and I get a nice flat, even image, and then I can stylize it. Yeah. Why? Because in 30 seconds, it finds every good bit of exposure and evens things out. It's no different. Athentech has some great exposure technology too. And you know the goal here is don't fight so hard. So I think the people who get all hung up are ones that haven't had an opportunity to learn. And what I mean by that is, you know, I know how to use studio strobes, but usually they don't fit into my workflow or type of production. But there are times that they do. And there are times, you know, like in my camera bag, I've got a little tiny thing this big that has six loom cubes in it. And they're perfect. They're small. They're easy. I can rig up something and I can do some great lighting and I always have it. And that way I don't say, oh, I didn't get the shot because the lighting was bad. But if the natural light is good, I'll use the natural light because it means that I can shoot three times more pictures than if I have to set up light. Yeah. But if the natural light is bad, then I'm going to take time to set up light to get a good picture because I don't want to go out and make bad pictures. I don't want to go out and miss the opportunity or not deliver the shot to the client because, oh, well, you know, I, I don't believe in polluting the environment. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, I'm really against fossil fuels. Okay, but I couldn't get to the shoot on time because my car didn't have gas. Okay, that's just crazy. Like, you don't have to be against the environment to drive a car. You don't have to be against appreciating beautiful sunlight or natural looking light or using a reflector. You know, this is just the nonsense. This is like the thing of, oh, well, I'm a documentary photographer. I don't believe in ever addressing my subject or asking them to pose or giving them feedback or turning them. That's fine. I was a news journalist mm -hmm. and that's the type of photography I did. And that's yep. acceptable. But if that's not, why put limits on yourself if you don't have to? Yeah, because someone told you that uh, only real photographers shoot in a certain kind of way. So yeah. you put yourself in a box and, well, I'm not a real photographer if I don't shoot in manual. That's that whole idea, right, of yeah. only shooting in manual because only real photographers shoot in manual when you have this supercomputer in your yeah. hands. You don't have yeah. to use all the modes in the camera, but I, I use them where appropriate. I use manual when I'm shooting time lapse and yeah. I know how to shoot manual and I use manual when I'm shooting astrophotography, but I sure as hell use aperture priority 90% of the time. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know what real photographers do, Frederick? They get paid for their work and they copyright their photography. And that's about it. That's a real photographer. They take care of their images, they take care of their families and they get paid a fair rate and they have ethics and standards. How they get the job done, don't care. Yeah. Just get the job done. Charge a fair rate, make a good image, be ethical, you know, be a good business person, be a fair artist, don't exploit people and don't, you know, don't be nonsense. If you want to use tech, use tech. If you don't want to use tech, don't use tech. You know, uh, you know, I'll take somebody like Vincent Versace, who I've seen teach many times and make some of the most incredible black and white photography I've ever seen. Yeah. And when I watch the speed of which he works, I could never work that way. I'm the same guy who could never do models either because I never had the patience to let the glue dry and to do the little tiny brush stroke in the painting. I was always <laughs> buy the action figures and start playing and build with the Legos, right? <laughs> now, I was a Lego guy as opposed to a model guy. That Got doesn't it. mean I'm wrong. Yeah. It doesn't mean the guy that likes to breathe the model glue and paint with the little tiny brush with the two hairs on it is wrong either. <laughs> if you want to build a boat in a bottle, build a boat in a bottle. I'm going to be the guy who goes and rents the boat and goes and sails around the world and makes great pictures and isn't going to argue that I didn't build the boat myself. Yeah, you know? yeah. Do what's right for you. Yeah, you can love you can love building PCs or or you can love creating the stuff that the PC allows you to do, right? <laughs> so. yeah. And 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 you know what? 
I don't think anybody is wrong. You know, and what I mean by that is, is whatever makes you happy and makes you profitable is okay. Yeah. What's wrong is when you force your dogma on someone else or you get so tied up in the tech that you feel like you have to justify what it is you're doing and you attack others. Yeah. There's just no room for that. Yeah. You know, all the time you you face this as well as somebody who's written, oh God, you know, 40 books and produced 250 video courses that are available in places like Linda and others. All the time, people want to engage me in an argument, and I'm like, don't care. Mm -hmm. But you said this. Yeah, that's how I do it. But it's wrong. Works for me. Yeah. I get paid. <laughs> if you don't like it, do it a different way. Exactly. <laughs> or or people people will, will you know, like, like we were talking about how the photographers love to argue, right? There's also the, I call it Stockholm Syndrome, where... Mm -hmm. Hey, I bought X, Y, and Z brand of gear, right. software, lighting, whatever. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's the best because I've invested in that and I'm going to poo-poo anything else anybody else bought and argue why my purchase decision is superior to your purchase decision, right? Well, I mean, here's a perfect example, Frederick, right? Like a lot of the time I shoot on Sony because I like a lot of what it does. Mm -hmm. However, I started as a Nikon shooter. I still own all my Nikon gear. We do a lot of work for Canon, and uh, you know my production company does a lot of work for them. We shoot almost all of our video on Canon cameras, and I love their cameras. And you know we own a 5D Mark IV, and I've played with the RP, and I really like how they're innovating. And you know each of these cameras has strengths and weaknesses. I own Olympus cameras. I own Panasonic cameras. I own a Fuji that was given to me. I have the DxO mini camera. I have GoPros. I have, you know, I've got 360 cameras and I use the right tool for the job. Sometimes yeah. that's my drone. So right now I'm getting ready to board a plane and I want to do some cool street photography. And I just picked up the new Blackmagic pocket camera and I'm going to do some experiments with raw and light cool. and detail. But, oh, I'm bringing all these micro four thirds lenses. I grabbed my OMD and threw it in the bag and it'll be fine. Is it as high resolution as my Sony? No, which I prefer for my landscape work. But it doesn't mean that there's not times that I'll take out the Nikon because the Nikon is better with my studio strobes. And so I have the flexibility, obviously, with the production company and multiple photographers and people that we have a lot of gear and we'll use the right gear for the job. But there's times that the GoPro camera is the right camera. There's times that the, you know, the Insta360 is the right camera. And then there's other times that we're using a high-end camera and it's just the right tool for the job. And so I've never sold a camera ever. Uh, every camera I've ever bought, I either still own or I've given away. Wow. And the reason why I don't sell them is they have more value to me than they do in resale value. And I know for some people that may sound crazy, but I would ask this of you, you know, are you in such a rush to buy a new camera body that you are just churning through one every year or two? Because if you are, that's totally wrong. You should be investing in better glass. So, you know, do I have the, uh, the A7 III? I do. And I have the A7 II and I had the original A7, but in that time period, Sony released like nine cameras and I bought three of them. And I still have the other ones because when I do a time lapse shoot, I can set them all up. And if one camera fails or there's an equipment problem or it needs to go into the shop for cleaning, I could take the lenses off the shelf and keep shooting. Yeah. So you're like Jay Leno and his cars, aren't you? <laughs> every single camera, I've never had a camera and I shoot time lapse hit that magical number where the shutter stops working, you mm -hmm. know, that nonsense. People buy into this garbage, run them into the ground, run your cameras into the ground until they stop working, yeah. you know, and use them for every single thing, you know, treat what it as a I purchase, with... not a subscription to that manufacturer's product line, right? Absolutely. What did I do with my GoPro one, the original GoPro, we gaff taped it onto the bottom of a skateboard for a guy who was doing tricks and he ground the camera down into pieces and it made some of the most incredible footage because we captured it as the camera got destroyed because we didn't mind the camera getting destroyed because it was five years old and it had more than paid for itself 20 times over. It was that yeah. camera's mic drop moment, right? <laughs> yeah. It went out with a total crash. <laughs> I love it. Well, let's, let's end with this, Richard. I, I want to I wanna 
so we we started with a discussion on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, machine mm-hmm. learning, and all that. Yeah. I want to end with that as well, and sort of get your thoughts, knowing sure. the the vast universe of knowledge that's in that noggin. You know, and we sort of talked about the the ultimate future of just being able to describe an image and have the computer yeah. create it for you. But let's talk more realistically in the in the short term future. Where would you like AI to go? What's the, what's the not, you know not short term as in years, but or, or as right. in a, in months, but as in a couple of years from now? Where would you like things to to end up? What I'd like to see is a hybrid model where uh, we continue to take advantage of other experts, which is what machine learning is. When a company does machine learning the right way, they can do some good things. And the folks over at Topaz are doing some nice stuff with AI for sharpening. And I've seen it do some really good things. You know, I also subscribe to the belief of, you know, hey, just shoot better pictures. But, you know, I realize there are situations when people need to do upscaling and they're faced with this. And so, you know, AI is going to continue to solve problems, but it's like every other piece of technology. VR doesn't make a great camera. Creative use of VR and using it for the right project makes a cool thing. So, you know, just being VR doesn't do it. Just having your film be 3D doesn't make it win an Academy Award. So AI, if it helps photographers get their job done, is great. Where I want to see it go next is the hybrid model where software learns from you. So as you start to do repetitive things, it learns and offers to save you time. And, you know, sure, we can record a Photoshop action, but we have to remember to do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, we can go in and look at the image history of a file as we edit it, and we can learn from that, or we can save a preset. But I'd like to see the world meet so that not only can we make our own presets, but we can make our own workflows and that software can start to learn from us. But in order for that to happen, there's really three things that are going to have to change. One is people are going to need to get better computers with better GPU power. Some mm-hmm. of the amazing things that NVIDIA is doing in the real-time processing, it's all about the GPU. And so the style transfer stuff they're doing, where you can say, here's what I like and here's what I have, and it helps you get there, that stuff's amazing. Um, the other thing I'd like to see is that people acknowledge that there is a global community and that people would be more willing to share their knowledge. So you take something like a Wikipedia, and it's this incredible resource because thousands and millions of people have shared their knowledge. Is there crap there? Yeah. Are there mistakes there? Yeah. But for the most part, it's stabilized into this incredible resource that people contribute to that helps others. Yeah. Photography needs to get there. So photographers need to be less afraid about losing their jobs to people that are unqualified and we have to become more qualified as an industry. And so it's important that the bad people get pushed out and the good people take care of each other. And you know, the people that are doing it wrong get an opportunity to learn how to do it right. Not technical stuff, I'm talking business practice, ethics. You know, Just don't assume that the person that's outbidding you on that wedding or that shooting job has any idea how to do a budget or that anybody's explained to them that if they're not carrying insurance and not paying taxes, it's a pretty good way to end up bankrupt. Lastly, we have all this weirdness going on with what I'll call evil AI, right? So the amount of scary stuff that uh, social networks and big tech companies have been doing with our information is really freaking people out. Yeah, And that's the bad side, right? So What companies are doing in the photography space with machine learning is they're taking information that they're paying for that photographers are voluntarily offering up and people and they're, you know, they're being compensated for their knowledge to make photography better. I am 100 percent fine with that approach where I'm not fine is when, you know, there was a really big software company that has a stock photography business that was showing off things at their annual conference where they started using that huge library of stock photography to affect their content aware fill technology. And it's like, wait a minute, are you compensating all of those photographers whose images you are using to train your software? Did you pay them for that? Or did you just bury that in to the usage terms? And so I'm not fine when people's work is exploited. I am fine when people are paid for their knowledge and that knowledge can benefit other people. Because at the end of the day, 
most people just want better looking pictures. And most people who are making pictures aren't getting paid for those pictures. So I'm okay with that. Let's have the world have more beautiful photography. And if you want to get paid for your photos, let's make you faster, more robust, and more enabled to do that so you can make more money and work less. Because these days, most people work way more than they need to and get paid way less than they should. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, people that are watching this are, are holding up their hands saying, amen, you know, <laughs> yes, I'll, pre I'm sure I'll, preach I'll, Richard. I'm sure I'm going to I'm sure I'm gonna get a few of the, th the death threats or the, you don't get it. You're a hack messages, but yeah, of course, of course, guys, all this is about is embrace your art and use the tech. You have my full permission and blessing. You know, I, the guy who've written 40 books, including a ton of official Adobe ones, I'm the guy that has 250 classes on lynda.com. I use AI. I click the auto button. But I have enough sense that when it doesn't work, I know how to manually fix it. Or if it's not exactly what I want, I can get there in a matter of seconds. I'm the guy that will use whatever tool gets the job done. And that's why I'm the guy that gets paid and can take care of my family. So just use the tools at your disposal and stop apologizing for being efficient with your time. Love it. Richard Harrington, where should people go? You mentioned lynda.com and some other resources. If they yeah. want more of this, where where should they go? Uh, where, and you got, what, 40 plus books out there? Where's all this stuff at? There's got to be like a, a Richard Harrington Rome somewhere. Where is that? So I don't have all my books these days are ebooks. I release some free ebooks through Photo Focus, and I'm the publisher of Photo Focus, which is a great photography community. Uh, I'm also working with the team over at Skylum on their Luminar Flex product, which is this awesome Photoshop plugin. So I've been helping to design that product and uh, bring it out to more people. So I've really become an evangelist for AI. Uh, you know, Frederick, you do some of the same things as well in this industry. Yep. And so, you know, what I've been trying to do is instead of just teaching everybody how to do things, I've been trying to make the software better so photographers can benefit. So uh, over the last 10 years, besides being a working photographer and having a production company, uh, I've worked with some great software companies to make their tools better. Uh, right now, I'm doing a lot of work with Skylum. I'm really excited by what they're doing. Previously, I did some great work with the folks over at Athen Tech. I think they got a great product as well. And of course, you know, you and I both have worked with Apple and Adobe through the years. All these companies, for the most part, are doing some amazing things that make photography better. So, you know, what I would say, and I, I, I mean this in the sincerest way, the easiest way to find what I'm doing is this. Take whatever problem you're having about photo or video and then put Richard Harrington after it in your Google search. And there is about a 95% likelihood that you will find a video, an article, or a book. And 95% of what I've done is out there for either free or 10 bucks a month. And, you know, it's free as I can make it. And so that stuff is everywhere. You'll find it. But if you want to see a lot of stuff, Photo Focus is a great place to check out. I love it. I love it. Uh, and then final final parting shot. What's next for Richard Harrington? You got, you're got you an octopus in the industry. You got your tentacles everywhere <laughs> doing all kinds of cool stuff, you know. And yeah. obviously you're a passionate educator, speaker, and all that stuff. But what what does your end game, you know, look like with, with for, for Richard Harrington? Well, what I'm focusing on now is uh, creating ecosystems. So I'm really excited by the work I'm doing with Skylum. There's some great folks over there. And what's been great is how they're embracing photographers to help make the product better. But at the same time, they're not just listening to what the photographers say they want. You know, they're taking great technology and great engineering and great input and knowledge and combining that together. But... You know, what I'm trying to do is create more of those ecosystems. So places where photographers and photography enthusiasts and companies can come together to make everything better. So, you know, the reason why I've done so much education through the years is because every time I learn something, I want to put it back out there to, to make the world better, to make the creative world better. And, you know, that's been passion. And that was early part of my life. So for me, I'm going to keep pushing the boundaries of making sure that somebody who wants to put in the work has no barriers to succeeding. Uh, if you are unhappy with where you're at, you should be able to figure out how to spend 20 bucks a month on your education and log 10 hours a week. You can change that. And so for me, it's about democratizing the process. And so I'm continuing to push that people in more parts of the world 
and people who have more financial restrictions can get great access to knowledge with video and photography. And I'm continuing to put effort into companies like Skylum that are trying to lower the rates so that software is not expensive and people can make a fair living with tools that don't really overtax them. So that's what I'm trying to do is uh, basically I've always joked that I'm a, a social capitalist. So I like <laughs> I like money. I like to make money. I like to be able to provide for my family. But I want everybody to be making and be better off. So in that way, I'm a socialist. And I think that probably comes from, oh, I don't know, being on welfare when your mom lost her job. So I know that everybody gets it hard. And uh, I've been on welfare. I know what that's like. So for me, I want everybody who's willing to put in the work to have no problem succeeding. And so for me, I'm trying to take all that knowledge and turn it back into software and resources that people can access. You know, I don't think I'm going anywhere anytime soon, but you know, let's be honest, my life is half over. So I'm very happy with what I've done. And for the second half of my life, my focus is on improving the industry and improving our tools, improving our knowledge and making sure that everybody who wants to succeed can succeed. I love it. I love it. Very well spoken. And, you know, I would argue that your life is not half over. Um, <laughs> it's if, halfway begun. <laughs> if, no, because, you know, at some point within the next decade or so, we'll figure out how to get all that knowledge and your essence yeah. into a uh, supercomputer or an app so I could just <laughs> download Richard and ask you questions just like this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so cool, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Sure. I appreciate Thanks. it. Always, my my brain always explodes whenever we chat on or offline. So this is this is great to have captured this and share this with the TWIP audience. So thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right, Richard Harrington. Take care, man. This is TWIP.